Welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams. Thank you so much for joining me. This week, as economies around the world begin to open up after multiple lockdowns, will Africans be looking for jobs overseas again? We'll bring you the stories of young people who took the leap and what they say they learned. Also, risking abuse and exploitation in the Gulf. We speak to the woman who has documented the harrowing experiences of African migrant domestic workers in the Middle East. And are we headed for a global post-pandemic migration surge? Our international experts weigh in on the shape of immigration in the US and across Europe. All that and more coming up in the next hour. Straight Talk Africa starts now. There are supposed to be opportunities of a lifetime, jobs overseas with money and adventure. But for some, it doesn't turn out that way. We begin this week with young South Africans who chase their dreams to the United States and China and what they say about the risks and the rewards. Here are their stories. I was unemployed and I was desperate for a job. When Cindy Siwe Mdepa and Mapula Mokwele heard a recruitment agency was offering young South Africans internships in the United States in 2019, they were ready to sign up. They were told in order to qualify, they would have to pay various fees, totaling nearly $1,000 up front. They said application is 500 rand and then you pay 5,000 rand for the interview, and then when you get the job, you pay another 5,000 rand. And then they sent me an email that you they will give you a loan. The loan offer, they say, borrow $6,000 from a South African lending company, complete a so-called project management course, and you only pay back 50%. The rest would be deducted from your pay overseas. The women say the year-long job at a resort in the U.S. state of Wisconsin was also not what they had expected. They were deducting our hours and deducting our money, and they also didn't want us um, to get sick leave and stuff like that. The women say when they returned home early last year, after completing the lending company's project management course, they received letters of demand for the full $6,000 loan. And I was like, how is it possible? Because they were deducting that money each and every month on my paycheck. Mokwele sought legal help and her debt was cleared. But Ndepa says she's unemployed and can't afford the legal fees to fight the lending company. Okay. Neha Misra with the International Workers' Rights Group Solidarity Center says this happens more often than we think. So if you're looking for a job and someone asks you to pay up front for that job, that should be a big red flag for you and a big warning sign. I ended up being detained in uh, China because uh, I had been given a fake visa from my uh, agent, which had been arrested due to giving more than one fake visas to about over 500 teachers in China. And because it was a visa issue, we had to be detained for about one month. So being detained was uh, very scary because not only am I in another country, but I'm also alone. I have no family members. I have no money. I cannot do anything beside listen to what they say and do what they say. What I've seen now is that anything can be taken away from you if you are in a foreign country. Do the full process. Never ever take a shortcut, especially when it comes to dealing with another country. There's a lot of ways to verify online whether or not a recruiter is legitimate and then if that recruiter uh, has an actual contract with employers. And so ask a lot of questions, get all of the information you can in writing Keep a folder, keep copies of it with your family in case it gets lost when you migrate. Um, keep copies of your passport with you at all times. Um, you know, as much as possible, create a digital trail, create a paper trail to help you out. And every one of those young people I spoke to said to me they would work overseas as long as possible, provided they find the right opportunities. Now, for more than 10 years, Rothma Begum has been documenting the experiences and working conditions of migrant domestic workers in the Middle East. And you've got to hear what she has to say, because some of these stories are just harrowing. And a warning, 
Some of the themes we discuss in this interview may not be appropriate for children, so viewer discretion is advised. Begum is a researcher with Human Rights Watch and spoke to me via Skype from the United Kingdom. Well, there are millions of migrant domestic workers in the Middle East, and while some of them have decent working conditions, many of them face a huge number of abuses, largely because of abusive immigration policies, as well as weak or non-existent labor law protections. Now, many domestic workers have told me that when they arrive in the country, their employer or their agent confiscates their passports. This is a very common practice. They can face working up to 21 hours a day without any rest or day off. Um, they've also spoken to me about having their food restricted and being confined to the homes of their employers, and even in some cases being physically or sexually abused. So the kinds of range of abuses we're talking about are quite horrendous, and they can sometimes amount to forced labour or trafficking in forced labour as well. Now, of course, Rotno, you've been documenting the experiences of domestic workers in Middle Eastern countries, some of them, of course, from African nations. What have these women told you about what life is like for them? And which story has stood out to you the most? Sure. I mean, just to say that these kinds of abuses are, you know, it's not clear exactly how prevalent they are, but we can tell from the work that we've done. You know, I've worked on this issue for more than 10 years, and many of these domestic workers talk about the way in which these practices occur, right? And, you know, while we used to see a lot of Asian domestic workers, we've been increasing over the years seeing, starting to see African domestic workers go into the Middle East. And the same sort of abuses that we've documented on Asian domestic workers are also being ha happening now to African domestic workers. So I um, went to Tanzania and I interviewed 50 Tanzanian domestic workers, women who were formerly domestic workers in the Middle East, and they told me about what had happened to them. And one of them really struck out with me. It was a horrendous case of a woman um, from uh, who's, who we're calling Atia uh, to preserve her secure her name. Um, she left Kondoa in Tanzania and traveled to Oman in June 2015. And her employer confiscated her passport and phone as soon as she arrived. They then forced her to work 21 hours a day without any rest or day off. They didn't allow her to eat without permission, and they were beating her every day. Now, for about three weeks, she endured this, and then she tried to run away. But her employers caught her and brought her back to the house, and they beat her and demanded that if she wanted to leave, she had to pay around $800, which was the recruitment cost that they had paid for her. So she continued to remain in this house where she was now confined. The employees prevented her from leaving the house at all. And for almost a year, she was working in these conditions. And then what happened was a year later in 2016, she found herself unable to work because she was um, her throat had started to swell up and she wasn't able to eat and she fainted. So employers took her to the hospital. The, when the hospital cleared her and it let her leave, the employers brought her back. And her, her female employer then accused her of uh, falling sick when she should not be falling sick and she was here to work. So her and her sister-in-law came over and they beat her. They stripped her naked, beat her with plastic hangers. Then the husband came home. He took her into a private room and he raped her anally. They then took her out of this house, took her to, their, to his brother's house. And the next day, they put her in a plane back to Tanzania. Before they did, they took away all of the money that they had given her for her, for her wages for the past year and just gave her a passport back. So she told me she arrived in Tanzania completely traumatized and didn't know who to turn to. Can you, if you can imagine this woman, like her entire year of her life was lost and she'd been left much worse than she was when she had turned up to Oman, you know, just what, to, learn, to earn living wage in order to be able to send that money back home to her family. Now, this was a really horrendous case and it's one of the most egregious cases that we've heard of. Um, but some of the elements of what she talked about is actually quite common. The confiscation of the passport, making them work without a day off. When we talk about a day off, you know, a normal day off once a week that people are used to in any other type of work. When it comes to domestic workers, they're denied rest days. And when I speak to some domestic workers and I say, no, do you get a day off? They laugh at me often. They're like, what do you expect? This is the Middle East. Of course, we don't get a day off. This is very common to hear. You know, some women are given a day off, but they tend to be a little bit more uncommon. So this type of work where in general, your overwork is quite normal, the, the lack of rest days is quite normal, that it's a little bit less and it's not as common, but you do get a number of cases of women who do find themselves in situations where they're being beaten every day 
or incredible um, situations in which the employer or his family members are, are sexually assaulting or even raping her as well. So those are maybe a slightly less numbers in, in total, but they are not totally uncommon. I mean, half the Tanzanian women that I spoke to spoke of sexual harassment and assault by family members or visitors to their home as well. So, Rothner, describe for us what would qualify as a decent work environment for a domestic worker. What is that supposed to look like? Because sometimes the lines look very blurry. Absolutely. We have women who are traveling to the Middle East because they want to earn a wage for themselves and their families. And they may be coming from conditions in which they're struggling in poverty and unable to feed their own families and so on. But when they arrive, they're expecting a level of decent working conditions. They should be entitled to an eight hour working day with rest hours, with rest weekly, weekly rest days as well. And they should be finding themselves with, they're able to keep their own identity documents like their passport, expecting a, a wage that is timely, you know, given to them every month or weekly, whenever it is that they've agreed, but the wage that they had been promised. A lot of women spoke about the fact that, you know, one, it's very common to have your passport taken from you. It's a very immediate thing that happens. As soon as you arrive at the airport, the agent will take it or the employee will take it straight away. Your phone may also be confiscated. Your phone should not be confiscated, right? So these are things, if you think about what is a regular worker entitled to, the same working conditions that regular people have, domestic workers should be entitled to as well. But in a number of these countries, migrant domestic workers are not given the same labor law protections as other workers in the country. Even like com in comparison to say construction workers who are mostly migrant workers as well, they're not afforded the same labor law protections. We've increasingly started to see some Arab states adopting specific legal protections for domestic workers. And only really two countries like Oman and Lebanon are the only two countries of the six major destination countries that have not provided any legal protections for migrant domestic workers. So in those countries, there is no legal requirement to give a worker a day off, right? Whereas in other countries, there is a legal requirement to give workers, uh, migrant domestic workers a day off, but employers simply do not do it. So while there are a set of conditions that we should be expecting for domestic workers, and this is, you know, some of these workers who are going are prepared to work very hard. They're expect they they go in there to just earn that wage, and they will tolerate. A, they're willing to tolerate some, you know, very very hard working environments. But it's incredibly exhausting. Overwork is some of them is incredibly hard, right? It's people don't talk about how dangerous overwork is. You're making someone work so long that they only get four hours of sleep a night. That leads to exhaustion. It leads to depression, and it leads sometimes to women taking their own lives because they can't find a way out from such terrible conditions of overwork. So we do need to think about why not only do working conditions should exist, but why it's important for those working conditions to exist, because it's actually incredibly dangerous to work in such an environment. Rothna, tell us more about the kafala system. How does it work? What's right with this system and what isn't? All of these abuses are really happening largely because of this abusive immigration system, which is what is known as kafala. Kafala simply means sponsorship system. And what that means is that when you, as a migrant worker, are coming into the Middle East, your visa is tied to your employer. That means your legal status is completely dependent on your sponsor, who is usually your employer. Um, you cannot enter the country without your sponsor. They have to agree to you coming into the country. Once you're in the country, they can cancel your residency anytime and have you leave. They can also re um, have to give you permission for you to change jobs, right? So you can't even go work for the neighboring employer without that original employer's permission. And you may not even be able to leave the country without the employer's permission in some, some countries as well. If you leave your employer without their permission, as in like you leave the house, you've decided you've quit, you can't take it anymore, your employer, your sponsor can call the police and have you arrested for what's known as absconding. So that is actually a crime in a number of these countries. It's an immigration violation and you can be arrested, you can be sentenced, you could be finding yourself in prison for some time, even um, given fines and then deported and even a, a, a re-entry ban. So you can't actually re-enter the country to work for a different employer. And so we need to understand how the kafala system 
this huge level of control that an employer has over a worker can induce and foster and facilitate that level of abuse, right? This is the reason for why when a migrant worker, when she's, before she leaves the country in Tanzania or Kenya, she's being told she's going to work for a family of three. She'll be paid, you know, $1,000 a month. You know, she's thinking these are the things that she's being promised. When she arrives, she can be working for a family of 20, right? And the employer will be saying, I'm only going to pay you $200 a month. And she cannot do anything in that moment because the kafala system prohibits her from leaving that employer. She cannot leave and go work for somebody else. She can't decide to even leave the country. These are the things that she simply cannot do because the employer has that power over, the, over her and the state enforces that power, right? So I have w women who are telling me about how employers sometimes told them that they bought them, that they believe they actually paid for them because they pay for recruitment costs to hire them into the country. They believe they already paid them. So they stopped paying them a monthly wage. And when they fled, when they actually fled abuse and went to the police to report the abuse against them, the police sent them back to the abusive employer. So this, again, gives you a sense of how the states themselves believe that the employees have that level of control, and it can amount to situations of slavery and forced labor. So where and how are these migrant workers recruited? Can you give us a sense of the regulation environment around this type of labor recruitment? So if you look at recruitment, it really starts from the Middle East, right? So the employer is paying a recruitment agency a set amount of money to recruit the migrant domestic worker into, into the country. And they will look at a catalogue of workers. They are usually liaising with a local agency or a mediator in Tanzania or Kenya or Ethiopia. And that's the person who's actually going around trying to find domestic workers in local villages. Those recruitment practices can be quite abusive. And the reason for that is because the employer, having paid a certain amount of cash to the agent, the agent guarantees the employer that they will provide them with a domestic worker. And if there's anything wrong with that domestic worker, they will, will give them a refund of about three months. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is that you, what you see happen in practice is that the local worker, the you know, Tanzanian woman or Kenyan woman, she will be told by her agent all sorts of things. You know, you're going to get a good wage, all of these things. None of these things, those agents can actually guarantee. They cannot, they don't get full information about who that employer is. So that agent may sometimes be lying. They may be deceiving the worker, but often they just don't have that information to really tell the worker. I've documented recruitment practices where local agents not only lie, but they make domestic workers sign contracts saying that if they decide not to go to the country or if they turn up to Oman or the UAE pregnant or ill or refusing to work, that they have to pay the agent money as well. Right. And the reason why that agent is doing that is because they will be facing repercussions if they are not paid uh, if they don't provide the worker to go in the first place. So this guaranteeing of system at the end where the employer is paying that money, that's where the onus is. And that's why you see domestic workers constantly facing recruitment practices in which they're being deceived and lied to. Now, the regulatory environment around this is very, very weak. There is little to no oversight of recruitment agencies in the destination countries. So in countries like Saudi Arabia and Oman and the UAE, there's very little that the government is actually doing to, to check what those recruitment agencies are doing to um, on bad practices. And very similarly, in countries like in Africa, there's also very little oversight of what rec recruitment agencies are doing as well. So you have this combination of very weak enforcement mechanisms in which his agents can go around pretty much saying what they like, promises, promising what they like, and sometimes being complicit in a situation of trafficking in which they're promising and deceiving a woman who turns up and finds herself in a situation of forced labor. So it is incredibly important that in order to crack down on these recruitment practices, that there is a, a stronger a regulatory framework in which you have inspections at these recruitment agencies, you have registered agents who are able to be sanctioned if they're caught being abusive to a worker. Now, Rotna, you have sounded the alarm on this over the years and again now in the light of the pandemic. And you have advice for home country governments and the GCC states. For those wondering what GCC means, that's the Gulf Cooperation Council. That's a regional bloc consisting of Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar and the UAE. And Rotna, you say there are steps that these, these governments can take to inform and educate employers as well as protect migrants workers. 
Absolutely. So firstly, you, you need to abolish the kafala system because that is the root cause of all of these problems. You need to increase labor law protections that ensure that domestic workers have a guaranteed right to a day off and eight hour working days. Now, some governments have some of those conditions, right? Once you have those in place, those governments in the Middle East should be educating their employers that this is what they should be doing, that when a worker turns up to the country, that they are working with the domestic worker on their tasks, that the employer should be ensuring a right to a day off for workers. Um, and at the same time, governments in Africa, like in Tanzania and Kenya and Ethiopia, these governments should also be giving information to domestic workers about what their rights are. So telling them like, expect that you should be arguing for a, a day off, you should be expecting an eight hour working day, but not just giving them the rights based uh, education, but also telling them where to go if something is going wrong, who the embassy is and where to find the embassy, how to how to call and who to call, right? Setting up those uh, that system so that when a worker is facing an abusive situation, she knows where to go and is able to get that safety and that redress. And that includes ensuring that there is shelter at these embassies, right? So. You know, just telling them them to be able to call is not enough. You need to be able to leave that abusive environment and find a safe space. So it's really important to do that as well. The other thing, the other thing is we need a mass media campaign about this level of education. So you know, both of these governments combined need to talk about what does a healthy employment relationship look like and why is it important to regard a domestic worker as a worker? Because fundamentally, the problem that we're seeing is that employers do not see domestic workers as real workers and they treat them as subhuman. That's why they, they won't respect working hours. They won't give them a day off. They will take their passports. The way they're treating them so inhumanly is because they just do not see them as workers workers and as humans in their own right. Rotna, what is your advice to migrant workers themselves? Do you have any tips about how people can safely navigate these systems and environments? I think it's incredibly difficult. I understand, and a lot of women will say, you know, that they went, and some of them would advise women against going to the Middle East. Others will say, if you're going to take that chance, fine, but, you know, be aware, be very aware that the problem in the Middle East is that there is such a lack of protections, such a lack of space of where to go uh, when, when things go wrong. So it becomes really important to educate yourself as much as you can um, in terms of your rights, but also in terms of where you can go, having established networks. So if you're going to go to Dubai or you're going to Oman, making sure you know where your embassy is, having friends there if you do have anyone, connecting to a local union, any organization that you can connect with before you arrive so that if things are going wrong, you are able to immediately contact people. There are very specific tips that some, some organizations give in local countries, like for instance in Sri Lanka, there were organizations telling women to actually sew in their contact numbers and passport numbers into their clothes because the passports are taken away from them. So finding ways to actually even conceal information in your own, uh, you know, because documents are taken away, you know, having photocopies of them, whatever you need, having them with you um, and finding ways to keep that information and also being able to leave if you need to leave. Right. So um, the other thing I would say is learning a little bit of the language is really helpful so you know trying to find organizations in your country to learn a bit of arabic because it's it can be incredibly useful to negotiate and to get help when you need it when you turn up to this country and you don't have the language skills it can be very very hard so whatever you can do to try to protect yourself will be really important and just to say there are women out there who are absolutely incredible. They have managed to negotiate their working conditions. They will fight against their employees when they're in these situations. They will say no very early on because they know if they start to agree to terrible working conditions, they will, it will get worse. So some of them really stand up and they stand up early and sometimes it works. Sometimes families will concede, they will, they will allow them that day off, they will stop treating them as badly as they do. Not everyone is in that condition, sometimes it can get worse. But I have to say, you know, women out there, they're fighting and they're finding ways to organize. And so whatever you can do to protect yourself, but also to work with others and make the situation for everyone much, much better is what I would recommend you do. And that was Rothner Begum from Human Rights Watch speaking to me from London. Are Africans still coming to the United States? Every year, millions of people try to immigrate to the US, but it's not that easy and the rules keep changing. To help make sense of it all, I spoke to US foreign policy analyst Johanna LeBlanc and Abel Chikanda. He's from the Kansas African Studies Center. Johanna, Abel, thank you so much for being with me. 
Johanna, a few months ago, the Biden administration let the Trump era visa bans expire. Broadly speaking, what is the Biden administration's visa policy right now? Well, the Biden administration reversed um, Trump's uh, Muslim ban, which um, prohibited a number of countries um, from having their from their nationals be able to enter uh, into the United States for immigration purposes. Um, so I, I think this decision came about because the Biden administration understands the importance of multilateralism, right? The importance of working with nations, the importance of freedom of movement, right? Um, um, because we know when immigrants come to America, in particular from the African continent, um, it's good for both the American economy as well as African economies, um, because we understand that um, Africans who come into this country, they work um, and they contribute greatly to, in terms of remittances, um, to their country. Um, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa alone, we are talking about over $33 billion annually um, sent back home in remittances, which helps with the development of these various nations. Uh, so again, I, I think it was a good move on the on the Biden administration to reverse um, the previous policy, which a lot of people argue that came from a place of discrimination, a, a, a place of racism. Um, so while this is a good step in the right direction, but there's so much more that needs to be done in terms of immigration um, of Africans coming to the United States, either for work, um, for, um, for study, or to live, and also family reunification purposes. And what about the green card lottery? Is that back on? So first and foremost, in terms of the green card lottery, um, the Biden administration has increased um, the cap. I believe it's now at um, 80,000, where it previously it was at a lower rate. And the 80,000 is not just for Africa, by the way. It's globally, right? Um, and you have to compete um, in order to, 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 um, to be a green card lottery beneficiary. Uh, but as, as far as the H-1 um, B visa you just talked about, that is for specialized skilled workers. We are talking about engineers, right? Um, and under the Trump administration, um, that was not a program that he favored because he felt as though um, immigrants from other countries were coming into the United States taking jobs from Americans, right? But the study shows um, that when it comes to the STEM, which is a science, technology, mathematics, um, and so forth, um, there, there isn't sufficient Americans with those skill sets, uh, which is why the H-1 um, B visa is so critical to attract uh, those from the African continent to come and to work. Now, the United States has been known for its guest worker programs. Uh, what does that look like now? And to what extent does it pertain to Africans, Johanna, and the kind of work people from African countries come and do as guest workers? So, Haiti, the guest workers program um, is designed for um, low-skilled workers. Um, and we saw during the, the global health crisis um, how essential those workers um, are because they were at the front line um, in providing services to the American people and putting their lives at risk each and every day to make sure that America can function um, adequately. It is those guest workers um, and, and, and low skill workers that essentially carried America through the pandemic, right? Um, Congress recently introduced a legislation which would um, create a pathway to permanent residency and ultimately citizenship for guest workers if this legislation were to pass um, as a way of thanking those guest workers um, and, and migrant workers here in America for their services during the global health crisis. Um, it's, it's in, it, I believe it has already been passed in the House. It is currently in the Senate uh, waiting to be voted on. Now, how likely is that um, to happen? I'm not sure because as we know, um, there is a great deal of conversation right now about um, Im immigrants, right? Coming to America, quote unquote, taking jobs from Americans. But the reality is, for most of these positions, um, the American people don't want them, right? They are low-skilled um, jobs that don't require a great deal of training. We're talking immigration to the United States. Are Africans still coming to America? Here's more now from my discussion with U.S. foreign policy expert Johanna LeBlanc and Abel Chikanda from the Kansas African Study Center. 
Abel, you've done a lot of work around this. What kind of job opportunities are there for skilled Africans in the United States? Are there particular industries for which various African talent or skills are in demand? I think it is fair to say that uh, immigrants, uh, African immigrants, they are found in all sectors, across all sectors of the uh, American uh, economy. So we have thousands of African immigrants working in the healthcare industry, for example, as nurses, as doctors. And we even have uh, a few fortunate Africans who have been able to make it uh, uh, even in competitive fields such as Hollywood, uh, uh, African actors, and so forth. There's been a steady rise of African immigrants in the higher education sector, uh, made up mostly of people who arrive in the U.S. with student visas. Uh, who graduate and they are offer tenure track uh, positions uh, at American universities. And we also see the same trend uh, in sectors such as IT and engineering, uh, where uh, there is a sizable number of uh, Africans joining th these sectors. Uh, and sectors such as healthcare, for example, they are challenging to break into, uh, especially if you arrive uh, from Africa uh, with the qualification that you end there. Uh, and uh, those qualifications, they are not uh, easily recognized here. You have to uh, do maybe a, a, a certain amount of time in residency and so forth. Uh, so uh, for those individuals, it's quite difficult. Uh, but we are seeing uh, more and more Africans uh, joining uh, the medical field and also the nursing training programs uh, as, uh, as trainees. And uh, after, after graduating, they are joining the workforce uh, you know, sometimes I think people outside of our context uh, don't really appreciate how much wherewithal it takes to come from the African continent, to come and live and work in North America. Just the visa process, the finances you need. And I want to ask you, Abel, how does that uh, process look and feel like today? And does it differ from African country to country? Yeah, basically, uh, your purpose of entry determines uh, the kind of process that you uh, go through. So basically, there are two main groups, uh, main uh, visa groups. Uh, so there is the non-immigrant uh, and the immigrant visa group. Uh, so non-immigrant uh, visas, they are short-term visas uh, that are awarded to, peop to people who intend to uh, visit uh, the U.S. Uh, on a temporary basis. Uh, for uh, uh, businesses, uh, for business, uh, for tourism, for medical treatment, and certain types of uh, temporary uh, work. Uh, so if we look at the statistics, uh, in 2019, there were about uh, 350,000 uh, visas that were issued to Africans uh, uh, um, uh, in that year. So uh, these visas, they enable uh, Africans to come on a temporary vis uh, basis to visit friends, uh, and an overwhelming majority of individuals who come on these visas, uh, they go back to Africa. So if you one intends to obtain this kind of visa, uh, you need to show evidence that you have significant ties in your home country. So you have a job, you own property, you have a family, uh, and it is so you need to convince the um, uh, official, the immigration official who interview you that you intend to go back uh, to Africa after you conclude uh, your uh, at, at the end of uh, your, your 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 visa uh, period, and uh, we are also seeing a growing number of uh, people who are entering the U.S. as students uh, are using the F1 academic visas. Uh, so in uh, 2019, for example, there were an estimated. 50,000 African-born students studying at different American university campuses. So for one to be issued uh, with this visa, you need to be uh, in possession of a letter of uh, academic of, uh, of uh, admission uh, from a U.S. college, as well as a uh, proof of funds. Uh, so you need to demonstrate that uh, you are able to uh, sustain yourself uh, uh, in the U.S. that you will not become a responsibility uh, to the U.S. Uh, uh, government and society. Uh, so the proof of funding, sometimes it can also take the form of uh, a bank statement that shows that you have this much funds in your bank account that will support you, or you can show that you have been awarded a scholarship 
uh, from a uni uh, U.S. university. Um, so there are also, also other programs that are important, uh, such as the uh, diversity visa, for example, which is popularly known as uh, the lottery. And um, uh, Africans, uh, they have a lower rate of uh, uh, immigration to the U.S. compared to regions such as Latin America and Asia, for example. So they tend to take up uh, the vast majority uh, of the uh, diversity visa. So nearly 38% of uh, the total uh, diversity visa recipients, uh, they are from different African countries. So you don't need to have a job secured in the U.S., uh, you don't need to present evidence that you can sustain yourself to be uh, eligible for this uh, diversity visa. Uh, what you need is pure luck. Uh, so once you apply, your name is drawn from the lotto, uh, they invite you to submit an application. Uh, but uh, there's only one country uh, that is not uh, eligible to apply uh, for the diversity visa on the African continent. Uh, that's Nigeria because of... Uh, historically high uh, rates of uh, immigration. When it comes to visas to the U.S., uh, uh, some of the policies uh, that have been pursued recently, uh, uh, especially by the Trump administration, they had an impact uh, on the number of visas that were awarded to Africans. Uh, so, for example, quite a number of Africans have arrived in the U.S. as refugees. So when uh, former President Trump introduced the refugee ban uh, and lowered the ceiling of uh, refugee arrivals. That also reduced the number of uh, Africans uh, that were uh, settled uh, in the U.S. Now, Johanna, we've heard a lot about not just the plight, but also the contributions of so-called dreamers under the DACA policy. DACA, of course, stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And one tends to think about dreamers as being Latino. But this does affect African immigrants as well, doesn't it? Yes, certainly. And, and you are correct. It's, it's roughly 1%. Um, the vast majority are, are, are from um, um, Latin America and so forth. Um, but, but I think that even though it's, it's a small number, I, I think um, we, we need to be concerned. Um, in fact, um, Congress recently uh, passed the H.R. 6, which is the Dream and Promise Act of 2021. If passed, um, it would grant DACA recipients, which would include roughly 1% of Africans, as well as TPS recipients, which there are a number of um, Africans who are um, TPS recipients from a variety of countries um, across the Af African continent. Um, even though when you think of TPS, you think mainly uh, folks from, um, again, Latin America, you think about um, Haiti in, in particular. Um, so under this, this, this legislation, if it were to pass, um, those individuals who are either TPS recipients or DACA recipients would have a pathway to permanent residency and ultimately citizenship. Um, it, again, it has been passed in the House. It is currently the Senate Judiciary Committee, and it has not been touched by the leadership. Um, and I think um, that is a policy that uh, um, Africans should continue to lobby on in terms of um, advocates and so forth, because um, the DACA program and even the TPS program, they are temporary programs. So that means um, the next administration that comes on board, if there is not comprehensive legislation, by a stroke of a pen, um, that program could be canceled um, and those individuals will have to return back to their countries because DACA, as well as TPS, they are temporary programs. That's it. Temporary, it provides you a temporary relief to live in this country legally. Uh, but the only way you could be certain uh, that you don't have to worry about an extension every other year and every time the administration changes is through comprehensive legislation um, and, and by passing um, the Dream and Promise Act of 2019. Um, there's also another legislation that has been introduced um, in the House um, that would create a pathway to permanent residency um, and ultimately citizenship. But the most um, critical one right now is H.R. 6, the Dream and Promise Act of 2021. Johanna LeBlanc, Abel Chikanda, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Time now to hear what you have to say. Now, of course, we put this question to you. Do you think there are better opportunities for Africans in countries overseas than countries on the continent? Why or why not? Alice Mango from Uganda is looking at the big picture here and says there are more opportunities in Africa because there are more problems. 
solving the problems is the opportunity youth have. They only need to be innovative, start small, and with big dreams. And then Muna Muna Mainga in southern France, but who is actually from Zambia, says, we produce people we can't use. For example, African countries have produced engineers and doctors, but the government, they will tell you they are, are unable to pay you. So people travel abroad looking for something else to do, and that's how they fail to develop their own countries. Sam Siame in Lusaka, Zambia says the opportunities are not better overseas. The pay for labor is better. Sam says our continent actually has far better opportunities. Also from the Zambian capital is Sikalele Kulu who says Africans need to stay home and build our mother continent. We have all we need to develop our continent. And these comments are fantastic. This is fast becoming one of my favorite parts of the show. So we're going to put up our next question in coming days. So please keep an eye out on Facebook and Twitter. Post your comments, tweet us, and we're going to pick a few again and read them on the show next week. As economies begin to reopen and people start traveling again, could we see a larger post-pandemic migration wave? We're already seeing reports that migrants could face new barriers. We're seeing walls go up and tougher high-tech border policing across Europe. We're showing you some startling images of Spanish police beating back migrants trying to cross into Spain from Morocco. But how will immigration policies change and how welcoming will receiving nations be after the pandemic? I put those questions to Dimitrios Papadimitrio. He's a political analyst and the president emeritus of the Migration Policy Institute here in Washington. I asked Papadimitrio if he thinks we'll see a post-pandemic migration surge. I imagine that there will be because there has been pent up demand, so I would expect the people who may have postponed their travel to Europe uh, maybe feel a little more energetic and hopeful about touching the, the promised land. <laughs> Now, Demetrius, let's talk about will versus wherewithal. In real terms, what are European nations' willingness and capacity to absorb waves of migrants and refugees, particularly from Africa? There is no single answer to that, but there are certain things that are fairly certain. <laughs> um, Europe is getting older. <laughs> and although Africa is not getting necessarily younger, the youth bulge the differential between really old and always getting older populations in Europe and re reducing youth bulges in Africa, but still, you know, on average, you know, between four and five percent growth in terms of fertility means that many more young Africans will enter or attempt to enter the labor market that the labor market can accommodate today or for that matter, 10 years from now. So if we're going to create a bit of an equilibrium in this, we're going to have to sort, sort of tell ourselves, Europeans will have to tell themselves that if they're going to work with African nations, they're going to have to do so over a long period of time. They're going to have to manage expectations in their own publics that somehow if they bring a thousand people or a million people today, you know, somehow this is going to reduce demand. Because the fact remains that for a time, let's say, of the next 10 or 20 years, demand will be almost unlimited. So instead of thinking just about migration, we should be thinking about migration in the context of many other initiatives. And the initiatives that work best is education. And you know that because, you know, you cover Africa, particularly education of young girls and women. And you're going to have to help create jobs. So part of this balancing act, part of this equilibrium will, I think, will have to say, you know, the Europeans will have to say to their own companies, you know what, if you establish you know, a factory that maybe will not be doing all of the most advanced AI kind of work, but it will be producing products and do so in Mali, in Niger, or any other, you know, pick a place, any place, 
we're going to give you, not only are we going to make sure that you don't lose your investment because things go to heck over there, but we also going to allow you to re-import some of those things without any customs, without any duties. So you're going to have to do that. And you're going to have to also, as I said, you know, focus on education. And health disparities will have to somehow gradually, over time, will have to sort of, if not go away, they have to become less. And the reason that they have to become less is because when people get better educated, have more opportunities to have a job, and the health disparities decrease, the expectation is that they're going to live longer. And then if they know that they're going to live longer, they feel that they will need fewer children because, you know, people are not dumb. You know, they have more children for a number of reasons. One of them is to have somebody to take care of them in their older years. Europe will have to agree to him, will have to agree, meaning the European Commission with the key member states that they're going to have to do this and really sort of stick to that, that they're going to have to talk to their publics. And then what you have is everybody deriving more benefits out of migration than the current system. The current system gives you deaths, horrible circumstances for the people who survive, reactions of local populations because all of these people seem to be coming unannounced, and loss of confidence in not only the ability, but also the willingness of their governments to really try to think differently about unwanted, the, the Europeans use the word, irregular migration. And one has to wonder how welcoming European nations will be after the year we have been through. I mean, even before the pandemic, we saw these worrying trends around xenophobia and the sort of nativist backlash in receiving countries towards migrants, all the way from South Africa to the United States and, of course, all over Europe. Is it about to get worse or not? It is not how much change that fuels some of this xenophobia. It is how fast the change is, okay? So, and how people enter. Fundamentally, you know, people fear change when change is too deep and too fast because you blink and things have changed. And that brings a certain degree of discomfort. You put that together with language, with, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, how people look, et cetera, et cetera. And you say, my God, I'm being overwhelmed. The fact is that Europe and increasingly the United States, you know, need immigrants. They've always needed immigrants. Okay. So in order to make sure that this happens in a more regulated way, we're going to have to think harder about how to select immigrants, what kind of immigration status we're going to give them, temporary, permanent, et cetera, et cetera whether it makes sense to invest in immigrants in our countries after they come to our countries or invest over there so fewer people will come. And we have to really understand that this condition, that this human condition to emigrate, to move, to try to do better for your family or to flee horrible conditions, we need to have a conversation that responsible parties, including people in government and out of government, the NGO sector, not the activists, because the activists have the luxury to only, you know, argue in favor of just this little segment of theirs. Governments have a responsibility to make decisions on behalf of all society. Most of the arguments are no immigration or open borders. That's not how life is, and that's not how the policy argument goes. The policy argument is how many, under what circumstances, how do you make those things legal, and how do you protect the interests both of your society, of your own people. By your own people, I don't mean just Americans, in other words, or just South Africans, but people who have the right to be in the place that you're discussing. 
The United Kingdom has now been in the throes of overhauling its post-Brexit immigration system, billing it as wholesale reform. This will certainly affect many Africans. Now, a nation that has had its foot in nearly every corner of the world for centuries, now opting for what looks like isolation. What do you make of the proposed overhaul and what do you think will come of it? I expect that the UK is going to move more in the direction of what some people will call the Australian model, some other people will call the Canadian model, which is more highly selected immigration. Um, whether there are actually going to be points, you know, that will be given to people according to a whole set of criteria, depending on the circumstances, the criteria can range from, you know, amount of education, experience, um, the willingness, you know, background in and the willingness to work in a specific sector of the economy and increasingly the willingness to go to a place where they need immigrants more than other places. But in addition to that, you have to create opportunities for people who come in temporarily as students or whatever else, you know, business people and all that. For those people who want to stay on and contribute to the UK, you have to create a pathway for them do, to do so. And that is also an essential part of an immigration policy. So borders need to be respected without, you know, without draconian measures, okay? You need to be able to select most of your immigrants. When I say most, I mean most, because there are certain people, you know, that are protected by international obligations that we have all taken voluntarily. Or, like in the case of Hong Kong Chinese, you make special exceptions for, you know, people who you, all, you want to protect because circumstances went well beyond what you expected them to be. And of course, we've seen the headlines over the years of what European countries are trying to do to stem the flow of migrants and refugees, talking about, you know, quote, a revolving door that they want to shut, especially when it comes to unauthorized uh, migration. Uh, there have also been some initiatives at the African Union on the continent looking at safe and orderly migration, as they put it. But in terms of bringing the EU and the AU together, are there enough African leaders at that table? And is that a table more of them need and necessarily want to be at? I'm sorry, you had now asked the $10 million question, and I don't answer those questions without $10 million on the table. <laughs> the first organized attempt to bring African leaders to the table in a systematic way was only in 2015. 2015 was yesterday. Many of the African Union leaders, not just the African Union, but, you know, African leaders, basically in private conversations following the event said, well, this was the Europeans' game. They wanted us here. We came, you know, we are fine. We're ready to hear and to listen to what it is that they have, but this is not serious. That We need a systematic, organized conversation, first among ourselves, this way, not only do we put on the table all of the ideas and then choose ideas where every protagonist gets something in return. Something. You know, you're not going to get all the people that you want to get work visas to Europe. But if you can get 75 a year, 75,000 a year, okay, you, that's, first of all, that's a significant number. Second, it reduces the friction between you and whatever, Europe, let's say. And it provides a front door, a front gate opportunity for people to go there, work, work in proper conditions and send money home. And you have to do those kinds of things, plus the kinds of things I spoke of earlier, in order to begin to sort of steer the, the, the big, big, gigantic ship of irregular migration around. So an organized country that has great institutions, a powerful bureaucracy, again, politics aside, which means that it can handle these things, okay? And it got 6 billion euro plus more money 
from the EU and individual member states. The EU has to, in a sense, to sort of clip its ambitions, the Commission, that somehow it should be making immigration policy for the member states. Member states want to keep control of who comes in under what circumstances and all, as long as there are conditions that must be met by everyone. So everybody will have to sort of clip their ambitions, be thoughtful, agree on what the goal is, and start developing, you know, sort of a a roadmap to get to it. And that was Dimitrios Papadimitriou, President Emeritus of the Migration Policy Institute, speaking to me here in Washington. And finally, with tens of thousands of immigrants who want to enter the United States waiting for their asylum cases to be heard, thousands more are waiting for a chance to enter the country and apply for asylum. Cecilia Mendoza brings us this story from El Paso, Texas. After an estranged journey, 42-year-old Mikel Atiz Rivial arrived in Mexico. He left Cuba in 2016, passed through English Guyana and crossed the Darien jungle twice in Colombia. Then he crossed Central America to Mexico. In Ciudad Juarez, across the Rio Grande River from El Paso, Texas, he requested political asylum in the United States. I had a dream that I was going to cross to the U.S. and that I was going to present my case. After living for almost two years at the Buen Samaritano shelter, he was granted entry after the Biden administration came into power. I don't know how to explain the happiness that I feel right now. I don't know how to express myself. Since February 19, President Joe Biden administration has allowed tens of thousands of asylum seekers into the U.S. to make their case with the assistance of the United Nations Refugee Agency, UNICEF, and the International Organization for Migration, the process began in San Isidro, California. In the OIM, we have two roles, mainly they're to provide COVID-19 tests with the support of specialized Mexican laboratories and a logistical role, which involves the transfer of people to the United States. However, this is not the fate of all migrants who today wait in shelters in Mexico. Thousands, like Eda Cristelia Melendez, were denied entry at the Mexican border under Title 42, which allows immigration officials to hold anyone back at the United States border for health reasons. I left by force with my granddaughter because my son had been shot. When Honduran Melendez crossed the U.S. southern border with her granddaughter, Customs and Border Protection agents fingerprinted her and she was returned to Mexico under Title 42. The officers told me no, although it broke their heart. They told me, ma'am, we cannot let you pass because of the pandemic. In an interview with Voice of America, White House Security Advisor Juan Gonzalez explained Title 42 implications and the reasoning to keep it in place. We are using the authority that we have under Title 42 to ensure that people who are not part of the Migrant Protection Protocols Program are expelled from the country, while we invest in strengthening the border's capacity to absorb and process migrants in a dignified and legal way, as it should be. In Mexico, Eda and her granddaughter wait at the Good Samaritan shelter. We hope that the administration, as it is taking these steps towards people with NPP, will also have consideration for all those who are waiting to seek asylum in the United States. But without legal recourse and overwhelmed by her advanced age, Eda hopes that the humane treatment promoted by the Biden administration will come sooner rather than later. Only God keeps my hopes up because in him I trust and to him I give all my causes. Eda's hope is that U.S. authorities will grant them the opportunity to enter the United States and reunite with her daughter in Chicago. Celia Mendoza, VOA News, El Paso, Texas. 
And that wraps up our show this week. We'll keep the conversation going on social media, of course, so please continue to connect with us there. Thank you to all of our guests on the show, our producer Zoe Liudaki and video editor Emery Christoph. Thank you for watching. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you.